Hey everybody, it's good to see you tonight. I, I'm doing something a little bit out of my normal. I don't know if I've ever been a part of a Good Friday service and so uh, something just felt led on my heart this week to uh, come to you and just spend some time with you in this, this wonderful day, just celebrating uh, what this day represents and, and just diving into the meanings and the things that we learn um, from what was accomplished through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, on what today is actually meant to celebrate. And so we'll, we'll let you get a, a chance to log in. Uh, as always, we'll ask you just to hit that share button uh, to let others know. Um, for our church, this is a unique service. I think this would be the first Good Friday service that we've actually uh, done. And, and I'm excited just to do it in a unique way, in a unique setting, just to be able to come out in God's creation, listening to birds as they're worshiping him. Uh, to be able to join with them and worship our risen Savior as well. So I hope this video finds you well. Uh, let me know if you're having any problems hearing or anything like that. Um, we're we're going to do our best to, to get you uh, back to your, to your life, which I hope is very much dictated and impacted by what we're going to be talking about today uh, in just a little bit. But I did want to share some things with you. I'm going to hold off on any announcements until the end of the video just simply because I don't feel like that needs to be any type of priority or anything that we're focused on today. Um, I'll just say on Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday morning, God really laid it on my heart to step out. I reached out to Pastor David and said, hey, let's just do something on Friday. Let's do a live stream. And I'm really going to open up and just share with you from my heart some things that God's been talking to me about and showing me through his word. And I'm just going to celebrate with you. And so I know today is called Good Friday, but in what it actually represents, it wasn't technically good at all. It's actually a day of tragedy when you consider the events of what took place. Um, it, it's a day designed to represent the day that Jesus gave his life for us. And while we celebrate that, it's because we know what happens three days later. Uh, we know that he raises us back up from the dead, that he, um, he comes back as a risen king. And so we can celebrate Good Friday today uh, because we have the whole picture of what actually took place. It wasn't just a death. It was actually a conquest. It was a, a war declared on the uh, bondage and damnation of sin, on the punishment and on the wages, if you would, according to Romans, of what sin deserves, and that is death. And so um, on Good Friday, Jesus went to war on our behalf. On Sunday, it represents where he came out the victor and, and as a result gave us victory. And so when we look at Good Friday, I think it's important that we realize that walking in that day it wasn't good at all. And, and what actually happened on that day wasn't a result of good at all. Uh, you're talking stories of betrayal, um, stories of, of intimate relationships that were broken by uh, people that were supposed to have been his greatest followers that were running away and hiding and even Judas uh, turning his back and selling out um, for just a few pieces of silver. Uh, his relationship that he had with Jesus Christ. And then you see this trial take place uh, with false accusation, um, a beating, um, a mocking ceremony to where they, they held false worship. And I don't want to get into this too much, but I believe that if we're not careful, that's what our Sundays turn into. If we're not careful, we can get into this idea where we're coming in and pretending to worship him. But in all honesty, we're still living the same lives and the same lies outside of that service um, as if what he is and who he is did not matter to us. And so I pray that's not the case in your life. But when we talk Good Friday, we're actually speaking of a day where Jesus was brutally executed. And, and I don't think we need to shy away from those details of just how brutal that actually was. And I, and I don't mean that to put a heaviness in your heart. I mean that to put an openness in your heart to receiving the love that was displayed through what Christ did for us on the cross. Um, no one in your life has ever loved you like that. No one in your life will ever love you like that. There's nobody else in our lives that has ever stepped up and said, I'll take the consequence for everything that Josh Moore has ever done wrong. I'll take the consequence for everything that you or anybody else has ever done wrong. It's never happened, um, nor would everybody, anybody ever be 
able or capable of carrying that kind of a weight, uh, much less being able to redeem it or, or justify it or to make it as if it, it never happened. We're, we don't have that capability. It takes a flawless person to be able to stand on behalf of the flawed. And so therefore we're all disqualified and none of us could ever do that. So there's never going to be a love in your life uh, that was ever displayed in a way like Jesus displayed his love towards us on Good Friday, on, on the day that he was tr totally abandoned, uh, left alone, um, mocked, ridiculed. And, and I would urge you, okay, at some point tonight before you um, go to bed or before you move on with the rest of your day to open your Bibles to Matthew 27 and just read the the accounts of all the, the trials, 26, the betrayals, and, and then in 27, the actual crucifixion and, and the burial. It actually ends with Jesus being placed in the tomb. And, and, and in all honesty, that's how this Friday would end for us as people that were followers of Christ had we been alive in the modern day in the time that Jesus was hanging on the cross. It would end with everything we believed in, everything we hoped for, everything that we had placed our lives in, in a tomb. But for you and I, that's not the case. Um, that's why it's easy for us to call this Good Friday when it actually wasn't good at all. But here, here's the thing that I have been really focusing on and looking at in my life. Um, uh, we, we've we experienced tragedy within uh, friendship and within our church this week. And and I actually literally less than an hour ago was standing in the driveway with Russ and Russ pulled me to the side and he said, if at some point in this weekend, he said, I'd never tell you what to preach. He said, we've got to talk to people that the resurrection has to happen here. And my heart exploded because I said, Russ, that's where God's been messing with me. And I'm going to tell you, um, because of what has happened this week, God has really pushed me to preach the sermon that I'm about to preach, to stand or sit or whatever you'd like to call it with you today in your home or in your car and just pour this truth out. See, a lot of times in our lives, we find ourselves in situations to where our world falls apart. Right now, if, if you would, as a whole in a nation, we're in a situation where nothing is normal. Nothing is what we're used to. I mean, we're, we're, we're confined to our homes. We're, we, we have rules that are placed down on our freedoms that are normally not there. Um, we can't even meet with each other on, on one of the biggest celebrated, if you would, religious days of the year. It's not religious for me. It's one of my biggest relationship days of the year with Christ. And we'll talk about this a little more. I kind of hinted to it a few weeks ago on yeah, how Easter isn't a religion. It isn't a service. It's a lifestyle. And I know uh, Bill Hart posted that and kind of gave you a little preview, but we're going to hit on it a little bit, if God wills, on Sunday uh, on what that lifestyle of resurrection should be. But as I looked at this, I realized that there were so many times in the scriptures where Jesus would be walking in the gospels with uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the gospels. He'd be walking with his disciples and he would tell them literally what was going to happen. He would, he would share with them. You'd hear things like, uh, they're going to tear the temple down and in three days I'm going to rebuild it. They'd be like, what is he talking about? Uh, matter of fact, the text that I'm going to give you tonight that um, we're going to look at really quick is, is in uh, Mark chapter number nine. And it's one of these moments to where the Mount of Transfiguration had just happened. You know, Peter, James, and John had just seen this m amazing event take place. And, and, and Peter didn't want to come down. He's like, let's build some monuments here for you to live in. And, and let's stay here and let's not leave. And as always, I think that's how we get. We get in these moments with Christ that are just overwhelming with joy and excitement and we want that to be the reality we want that to be what is forever and, and and good news because of the resurrection that is going to be the reality and that will be our forever however just like peter we're still on this earth we're still in a place that is full of hardship and there's still work to do and so anybody knows if you've ever had a job or you've ever had a relationship that work isn't always fun. And so Jesus was trying to teach these guys that, hey, listen, we can't stay here. There's work to do, but there is going to be a day that all this is made right. Matter of fact, I love John 14 and how it starts. It says, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. And Jesus is saying, hey, 
If you trust in God, you got to trust me. In my father's house, there's many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare that place, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you will also be. Wonderful truths. But again and again and again, you see Jesus trying to teach them, we're about to go through a bad day. Something tragic is about to happen. Something terrible is about to take place. And again and again and again, as he would pour this out, you would see them just kind of step back and say, I don't know what he's talking about. Matter of fact, if you would, um, if you're taking notes or you're looking, I'm just going to read right after the Mount of Transfiguration, right after this place, you, you, you see this where Jesus wants to talk to his disciples intimately. And, and so in verse number 30 of, of, of this chapter 9 of Mark, it says, leaving that region they, uh, region, they traveled through Galilee. And Jesus didn't want anyone to know he was there. For he wanted, I love this, he wanted to spend more time with his disciples and teach them. You know, I, I kind of find that to be the case of where God has his believers right now. He's wanting to spend time with you and with me and teach us something powerful about our lives. And so he's taking these followers of his and he doesn't want anybody else to know. In other words, he wants intimacy. And can I tell you, those of you that are sitting here listening to me that may feel lonely, those of you that have heartbreak and believe me, my heart is broken right now. Those of you that are in these situations understand that with this coronavirus and everything going around, it has opened up an opportunity for God to meet with you and he longs to meet with you intimately to teach you and to, to be personal with you. And so Jesus has taken this personal moment with his disciples and it's actually just a very brief uh, part of scripture. And even this chapter, it's a very short portion. And, and here's what he says. He says to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed. I mean, these aren't, he might be, it may be. This is as plain as you can get it. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. But three days later, he will rise from the dead. You know, there's many times in my life that I've asked, and, and I shared with you Wednesday as I poured my heart out that I have the questions of why sometimes do. And there's many times in my life that I'm asking God, show me, show me, show me. Just like the Pharisees and the scribes, God, show me who you are. Show me what you want to do, and then I'll believe. But, but just like this, that verse is clear. In, in, in Mark chapter number 9, verse number 30 and 31, Jesus doesn't leave any kind of like... Uh, guesswork or any kind of you figure this out or, you know, I got the secret that I'm not going to tell you. He makes it clear. He says this, I'm going to be killed by my enemies. The disciples knew who those enemies were. He, they had been there when the Pharisees wanted to stone him, wanted to kill him, arrest him, when they were driving him out of town and all these other things. They had witnessed it. They knew that these enemies had to be the religious crowd of the world. And I'm going to tell you this right now. The greatest enemy to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the salvation that God has offered through his son, is not the world. It is the religious crowd who wants to put their opinions and their belief systems and their egos and their agendas into what it takes to be a follower of Christ. It is the biggest enemy of Jesus' day. It's the biggest enemy of our day. The greatest thing that we could ever happen in our lives and in our walk with Christ is to not allow our religion to become what we worship, but instead to allow the relationship offered through Christ to become what we believe in and what we stand on and what we worship and what we follow and what we obey. Bay. And so in this, I, I'm, I go to church. I, I hate the fact that we have related church with religion because they're not the same. Religion is an act and a show and a ritual and a tradition to try to prove you're something. Relationship, church, is an act of worship, an act of obedience, an act of follow, an act of celebration because he has made you something. Religion's trying to prove you're something. Hey, church and, and, and worship and relationship is because he has made you something. And so I'm proud to go to church. Even if that church right now is online, I'm proud to be in church, but I am not religious. I am relational because Jesus Christ has made me a child of God. He has made me a brother. I'm a brother of Christ. You're a, you're a sister, a brother of Christ because there's been a relationship, but I have found this to be true. When I get super religious, it doesn't matter how clear Christ makes it. I feel like it's not good enough. 
And, and I don't know if that's the case in your life. How many things are we praying for a sign on? Are we asking God to show us because it just doesn't make sense with the way that we want it to go? Because we don't like Friday. We don't like the day of hurt. We don't like the day of pain. We don't like the day of separation and brokenness of, un, of the unknown and fear. We don't like that day. And how many times do we get in that day and we forget the message, the truth, the promise of what Christ has shown us, what God has, has told us and what God has made known in our lives. And matter of fact, he says, the son of man, I'm about to get killed by my enemies. But three days later, he doesn't even give them guesswork when it comes to the the time that he's coming back. Three days later, I will rise again. I will get up. And look at what the very next verse of that chapter says. It says in the very next scripture that they did not understand, verse 32, what he was saying. However, they were afraid to ask him what he meant. Now, I want to speak directly to your Friday. Not today. I know today's Friday. I'm talking about the days of pain in your life. The days when life has gotten out of control, the days when your hopes and dreams have been destroyed, or, or as in the Nibby family, maybe it's the day that your loved one has been tragically taken from you and you don't understand what's going on around you. And in these days, it is easy for us to forget what God has promised. It's easy for us to get forget what God has already declared. Matter of fact, do you know that the Pharisees at the very end of Matthew 27, what I told you to read earlier, the Bible says that after Joseph had taken the body of Jesus and buried it in his tomb, that the Pharisees went to Pilate and said, this guy has preached that three days later, he's going to get up. We want you to guard it and secure it so that nothing happens to which they're told this. He says, hey, take your guards Listen to what they're told by Pilate. Take your guards and secure it. I like this statement. The best you can. I mean, do your best. If this guy has said he's getting up, do your best. Let's see. Because if he's the son of God, he's getting up. And so here's what happens. In our lives, in the day of darkness, in the day of sorrow, in the day of hurt, it's easy to give up, to abandon, to walk out on, to divorce, to forget, to throw your hands up and say, I'm done. It's easy to get into a mindset of shutdown and walk away or anger. And believe me, I have battled my anger and frustration very hard this week. I'm asking for your prayers and that in my life. But in those, it's easy to get so caught up in what is happening in our lives that we forget what has been promised by a faithful God in our lives as well. And those of you that are sitting there thinking that you'll never break free of addiction, or those of you sitting there thinking that you'll never heal from this hurt that's, that's just raging within, for those of you thinking that you'll never recover, you'll never get back up, that you have fallen too far, or you have gone too far, or this has gone on too long, for those of you that believe you're too old, for those of you that believe that the world is just the way it is and there's never going to be a change, you are trapped in Friday. You are trapped in the day of death, in the day of when sin has ran its course. And I've seen it so many times in my life that sin gets to its point of finish and it's destroying my life. It's taking everything. And I'm standing there thinking to myself, how am I ever going to recover? How am I ever going to get back up? And maybe that's you today. That's exactly how the disciples responded. When Jesus was killed, they all went into hiding. Game over. All these things that we had seen, all these miracles, all these you will do greater things than I have done. Game over. Let's hide. Let's lock the doors. They were scared that their lives were going to be taken. They were scared that they were going to be killed. Even Peter had denied that he even knew Jesus Christ because he was scared of what may take place in his life because everything they believed in was gone. And maybe you've been in that point of your life, but there is a truth and there is a reality and there is something you and I must grab hold to that with every disease, with every hurt, with every broken heart, with every abused life, with every 
Friday of sorrow and hurt. There is a Sunday that is coming. There is a resurrection that will happen. There is a day where God makes all things right. And it's not something you and I have to guess on. It's not something like in the day of the disciples we have to wonder about. Because we don't serve a savior that's in the tomb. We serve the savior that walked out of the tomb. And you and I are just like the disciples. We we get in these days of devastation and we wonder if we'll ever recover. We forget that he has promised that resurrection is a legitimate spirit and the same spirit, it's not an event. Can I tell you this? Resurrection was not an event that occurred. It was a movement of the Holy Spirit and the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and lives in me. And so if today is the day of darkness, know that there is a day of light coming. If today is a day of hurt, know that there's a day of healing coming. If today is the day of death of a loved one in your life, know that there is a return of Jesus Christ coming. This may be the day of sorrow, but Sunday is coming. And that is something you and I have to get into our minds and into our lives. To the deepest addict, there is resurrection from your lifestyle. To the broken heart, there is a healing and a relationship that God wants to restore within you. And so may we not get so caught up in all the devastation around us that we forget that we serve a Lord, not just a savior, a Lord that walks away from devastation, not walking away, turning his back, walking away, putting it behind him, making it a part of his past for no part of Jesus's history. And from here on out, Will there ever be a part of his story to where death is ever something he is talking about again? Are you with me? God has not sent his son to die, to be raised again, to only have him to have to go back and to repeat that death. It is now a part of Jesus' past. And to my friend Denise, death is now a part of Denise's past. And life is now all she'll ever know, all she'll ever experience. And as me and Russ stood in his driveway today just sharing that that hey that the Denise has already been resurrected as I went with him to the funeral home today and we looked at her laying there we we knew that that was not her that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord that even in darkness and in heart heartbreak and even in sorrow there is a hope there is a joy why because Jesus is the rebuilder of what the enemy has destroyed and in our lives today, because of what took place on Good Friday, we have reason to celebrate. Today is the day that represents what sin can do at its worst, or if you want to call it at its best. But just a few days from now, we will celebrate what God can do just in a minute to the best of what sin can do. And today I want to just declare it. When Jesus was hanging on those that cross, we heard multiple different conversations, multiple different meanings extended. Can I share with you, those of you that are suffering, those of you that are hurting, that even when sin got to the point of pouring out on Jesus Christ, there's a moment where you find Jesus look up into the heavens and scream, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know that the earth went black. We know that earthquakes took place all over so violent that rocks were ripped. The Bible said every rock on the face of the planet was ripped. That a veil that was thick, that was made to to hide where the Holy of Holies was. It was ripped from top to bottom like a piece of paper just shredded. And we know that it was such a violent moment when sin was in full-fledged poured out on Christ Even God could not stick around to witness the grief that was being created. And in that moment, Jesus cried, why have you forsaken me? And I'm going to tell you something. Never once in your and my life have we been able to say those words and they actually be true. I've had moments in my life that I pray to God and say, God, where are you at? Like, God, do you even see me? Do you even know what I'm doing? But the reality is, is I'll never experience the reality of God being moved. 
There'll never be a day in my life to where God's presence has been removed from me because when God's presence is removed, the whole earth mourns it, even nature. Can I, can I put it this way? When the spiritual realm of our world is shaken, the physical world shows its attributes, shows its bruises. And on the day that Jesus died, the bruises of that anguish and that payment of sin, they were visible everywhere in the physical world to where we could not even see see there was a darkness and there was an earthquake and there was violent things taking place matter of fact the psalmist wrote it like this that the bulls of Bashan the demons of hell were gnashing on his body I mean Christ was experiencing the the punishment of sin in that moment and God's heart was so grieved that he turned his back and could not see it I've even prayed it lately God you know what grief is you know what it's like to see death at its finest take a life of someone you love So God, the comfort you needed in the moment of the death of your son is the same comfort my friends need right now in the death of their mother and their wife. And so God, you declare you're the God of all comfort. Pour that out. You declare you're the God of peace. Pour that out. But the reality is this sin at its worst on this earth and you're in my life is death. But death at its least in our life is promotion to the life of which God has created for us to be for us to have the the original intent, the plan, the wisdom made known as we talked about just a couple nights ago on Wednesday. So I don't know where you're at in your journey, but I do know this. If you're in a day of celebration, there will be a Friday. There will be a day that hopes and dreams die. There will be a day that hurts come. But there'll also be a resurrection day. There'll be a day that God works all things together for good. To those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. We know that God's will is to even manipulate the, the, the ways of the enemy to accomplish the great things that he has planned. I was reminded as I was reading, I was going back through scriptures and I was reading in John chapter number 13. And, and, and this is where Jesus was washing his disciples feet and they were having a problem, especially Peter. And Peter was like, you, you can't do this. You, you can't go wash my feet. And, and. And, and right before this moment takes place to where this dialogue goes back and forth with Peter, Jesus says, you don't understand what I'm doing right now. He says, you, you don't get what, what I'm preparing you for. In verse number seven, he says, you don't get it, but one day you will. What they didn't realize is, He was washing their feet in a preparation for the ministries that they were about to take on. It was almost like an ordination ceremony, washing off the past and empowering their lives, showing them that he would be actively serving them as they carried on the mission that God had intended for their lives. And so here is the savior of the universe, the king of kings on his knees before these disciples saying, you don't get this, but I'm preparing you to go to places you never thought you would go and to do things that you never thought you would would do. He says, you don't get it, but it's coming. And just, just seven chapters later, you find the disciples standing in an empty tomb. In John chapter 13, he's washing their feet and they're saying no. And he's like, you don't get it, but one day you will. And then seven chapters later, we find these verses. We'll hit on these maybe Sunday. It says, Simon Peter arrived and went inside. We're talking about the tomb. He also noticed in verse number six that the linen wrappings were lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus's head was folded up, laying apart from other wrappings. Then the disciples who had reached, reached the team first, that had got there first, also went in and he saw, and here it is, and believed. For until then, verse number nine, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. In that moment, in the Sunday moment, they realized what Friday was all about. In the Sunday moment, they realized what the feet washings and all the teaching was all about. See, on the day of sorrow, it's hard to remember or to understand what God is doing. But right now in your sorrow, it is just as if Jesus is there at your house, right in front of you, washing your feet, saying, daughter, son, you may not understand what I'm doing now, but one day you will. You may not understand this battle with cancer. You may not understand this battle with death. You 
may not understand what I'm preparing you for, but one day you will. And I promise you, brothers and sisters, I promise you that there will come a day in every one of our lives that we will stand in the resurrected moment of what God has been prepping us for, and it will all make sense what God had been doing the entire time that he was moving and working and willing to accomplish his perfect will for our lives, to make himself known we were created so that they could see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. And so today is a day that we mourn, a day that we celebrate in mourning. I know that may seem cliche and ironic and impossible, like a catch-22, but it's reality. My heart breaks, and so should yours, over what Jesus Christ had to endure as a result of our sin. What Jesus Christ took on because of the mistakes that you and I made, but it also rejoices. And here's why. There was somebody that loved me enough to take my mess on. There was somebody that loved me that while I was a sinner, Christ died. Not after I got cleaned up or made it all right or figured it all out or became educated and got a degree in, in, in spirituality. No, he loved me at my worst. He died for me at my worst that while I was a sinner, Christ died. I have always loved the song that when he was on that cross, I was on his mind. And it goes on and it says, he knew me, yet he loved me. You say, well, oh, wow, if he knew me, he should love me. No, no, no. He knew me at my worst and loved me anyway. He, he cared for me at my ugliest and he is making me beautiful. He, he took me when nobody else wanted me. He came when nobody else wanted to be there. He ran into my situation when everybody else was running away. He was loving on me when I was hating on him. That is what the cross represents. An un yielded love, an unrestrained love, and a, a non-circumstantial relationship being offered. And yes, my heart breaks that he died for me. My heart breaks that he was brutalized for me. But I can sit here in the morning celebrating in my heartbreak, in this morning of heartbreak, celebrating because I know that Sunday's coming. In the story, Sunday's coming. And so I know the end that he got up so I can celebrate too. The difference in my current life is, is I don't know yet the the results of what God is going to do through the circumstances of my life. You don't yet know the results of what God is going to do through the tragedies, through the heartbreaks of your life. But the truth is, is just like the Sunday came for Jesus to get out of the grave. There's a Sunday coming for you. And for me, we will walk away from these things that are hindering. We will be rid of persecution at some point. We will see a resurrection of God's original plan. We will see a return of Christ. We will see a ruling and reigning. We will see a worship service totally pure standing around the throne of God where nobody's trying to be the best, but we're standing there telling everybody he is the best. There will be a, a moment that all of this comes together and makes sense. But until that day, I got to believe that there's a reason that God is going to take my son and use his autism and use his life. There's a resurrection for him. There's a purpose and a plan for him. I don't know the outcome of his current situations, but I do know the one in control of this situation. I do know the one who owns the keys of death, hell, and the grave. I do know the one who owns the tomb that the world tries to shove us in. I do know the one who erases labels, who records new names on white stones, who, who takes off rags and replaces them with riches, who takes off broken and replaces it with righteousness who takes off sin and replaces it with a purpose and with a calling and with an adopted title. I know the one, my father's name on my birth certificate in heaven is not my earthly dad, nor is my son's father's name his earthly dad. It is the heavenly father through Jesus Christ who has made me a part of him. And I don't have to know the end of the circumstance. I just need to know the one who controls the end and that is the beauty of what this day represents. But how long is it going to take us to understand that there is no weapon formed on earth that could stand against you? The gates of hell cannot prevail against God's church. 
Even plagues can rule throughout our world, but the Bible says they will not even come to your door. Thousands will fall around you, but they will not touch you, Psalm 91 tells us. These are the promises that God gives us. I get people, believers, asking me all the time, what are we going to do about corona? I'll tell you exactly what we're going to do. We're going to trust Jesus. Resurrection is coming. Beautiful things are coming out. God's going to do something great, and you may be broken now, but you won't be broken forever. You won't be broken long if you'll trust in the fact that there's a Holy Spirit who is the resurrecting spirit who lives in you. And if you are not a child of God, he wants to live in you. And that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead wants to raise you up too, wants to raise me up too. And so in the middle of mourning, we can praise. In the middle of hurts, we don't have to hide. Hey, if you are in sin right now and you got things in your life that you know shouldn't be there, you don't have to hide. No, see, the disciples are hidden thinking they're going to die because of what's happened. Some of you are doing the same spiritually. You're scared to tell your Jesus story because uh, most of our lives have been about our story. And most of what you've done and most of what's in your closet has to do with you and very little to Christ. And if you step out of your closet, then they're going to crucify you too for the things that you have done. But I'm going to tell you now, there's been one crucified and he was enough. He has covered everything that you have done. And there is nothing to fear. It's time to be resurrected from our sins, church. It's time to be resurrected from the, the hurts that have been created by the words of others or created at the hands of others or even created by by our own words and at our own hands, it's time for us to realize that this may be the day that Josh Moore has died, but there is a resurrection that immediately takes place because of what Jesus Christ has done. And if this is the Friday of hurt in your life, there's a Sunday of resurrection coming. Trust in the God that has given you the promises. Don't lean on your own understandings. Acknowledge him in everything, and he is going to direct your path. I think it is time for the church to stop trusting the problem of the world more than we trust the promises of God. It is time for us to stop believing in the panic of a world and not and, and start believing in the promises of God. God is going to do something beautiful. And just like Jesus said, and we talked about earlier, and I'm coming to a close with this, just like Jesus said earlier, when washing Peter's feet, you don't understand what I'm doing, but one day you will. And mom who's hurting, husband who's hurting, wife who's hurting, family who's struggling, Somebody looking at their bank account right now and not knowing what they're going to do. Hey, listen, you have a resurrecting God. You have a resurrecting power living in you. You will not fail if you're believing and trusting in him. You will not be abandoned. You will not be forsaken. He'll never leave you. He'll go with you to the ends of the world. He is going to stay right by your side. And I think, you know, the beauty is, is unlike the disciples, we don't have to sit there and say, what does he mean? And, and you might sit there and say, but I got questions. You know what the Bible says there in, in Mark is they had the question. They were scared to ask it. If you've got questions that you don't have answers to, ask God. He wants to explain them to you. If you lack the wisdom, he wants to show you his plan. Yeah, he, He's not going to withhold it and he's not going to rebuke you for asking, James 1 tells us. Just go talk to God and tell him. If you need to talk to someone who believes in God, give us a call. Shoot us out a message because it is Good Friday, not because anything good happened on what this day represents. And I know Jesus died, but, but sin was destroyed. Sin was nailed to a cross. I like how Colossians says it. He took the record of wrongs that was held against us. He nailed them to the cross. They died there. The Bible says he stripped the enemy of all of his power in Colossians. In other words, he, he publicly shamed him. And when he walked out of that grave, even Satan knew. Even the demons of hell knew there was nothing they could do to stop him. And you know why Jesus wanted it to be so obvious that he was unstoppable? so that you and I could believe that through Jesus, we're unstoppable too. Through Christ, we have hope. You know, we sing this old, it's a new song saying in an old tone, an old kind of twangy way. It says, all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterdays are gone. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Today is the day that represents the blood. Today is the day that represents the beating, the broken, the abandonment, the hurt. 
But today was the day that took a step towards the resurrection day. And I'm going to tell you now, I've learned something in my life and I'm continually learning this. I don't like this lesson, but I keep getting reminded of it. There are circumstances of my life that I do not like. Things that take place that I oftentimes complain about. I, I, I shouldn't, but I know I do. I'm human just like you. There's, there's events that my kids go through, that, that we've gone through in our marriage, that we face within our families. And, 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 and even I carry burdens that I know you carry. I, I weep over you and things that you're facing. And I plead on your behalf. And, and when I run out of words to plead on your behalf, Jesus continues to plead on your behalf. And his words are way better than mine but I'm so thankful for that scripture. But there are times that something comes into my life that just shocks me or blows me away. And I'm like, what in the world? But what I've learned is that with every pain, we've taken a step towards resurrection. With every bad day, we've taken a step towards the good day. And every broken thing, we've taken a step towards things made right. And, and, and every day that I live is a day that I'm dying. And every day that I die, I get closer to Jesus. And so understand what Paul is saying when he's proclaiming for me to live. It, it's Christ. It's because it's a gift to me, but to guy, it is gain because I get to go and live with Jesus Christ forever and ever. And so I cannot lose. And that's the thing we've got to get into our minds that no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross, we cannot lose because he went to war for us. And three days later, he came out with the trophy. He came out in victory. He came out with, it is finished. It is over. It is done. And those words on the cross, were some of the greatest words that have ever been said to sin. And they're some of the greatest words you and I can say to sin today. It's done. It's finished. No longer will you have to live in the fear of what this can do to you because you can live in the grace and the peace of what Jesus Christ has done for you. No longer will you have to live in the worry of being separated from God because it is done. Jesus did what was necessary to make us right with God. I, we need some hallelujahs singing through our hearts, some praise the Lord's and thank yous echoing through our cars and into our living rooms wherever we are right now because those words, it is finished, are still just as powerful today as they were that day and they need to be said again and again and again. What would happen if you looked at Satan when it came to the mindset that you may be currently carrying that is broken and flawed like mine with anger and said, you're done, you're done, you're day is over because Jesus Christ has conquered you. What would happen to that addiction if we could look at it and say, it's done. It is finished. Not I'm finished. No, 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 no. I'll never be finished until God is done and finished working on me. But I can say in Jesus name, it is finished because Jesus Christ has already conquered this. Jesus Christ has already overcame this. And th there is nothing, nothing the enemy can do to you that Jesus Christ didn't overcome. And so maybe in Jesus name today, we should be echoing in our minds to whatever it is that's been holding us back, whatever it is that's been keeping us from being bold with our faith, may we echo the words that Jesus spoke on the cross as sin died. It is finished. May there be forgiveness flowing through your veins. May there be an utterance of, I'm letting this go. No more grudges. No more holding on to this. I'm moving forward. It's no longer holding me back because sin is no longer what I have as my identity. But because of Jesus' death, I now have his righteousness, his holiness, his sacrifice made available to me. And by his wounds, by his stripes, we are healed. It says all of us like sheep have been led astray, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity, the lifestyle of sin on him, the iniquity of us all. And so today, everything you think that has made you a terrible person was declared dead by Jesus Christ before he gave up his life for you. And so at some point, can you stand up, look Satan in the eye and just simply tell him you're done and you've been done for a long time. I've let you stick around way too long. I have abandoned the message of what Jesus Christ has preached to me. And I am not going to stand any longer and allow you to be the ruler of my mind or you to dictate my emotions. But instead, in Jesus name, it is finished. And three days later, we know he got back up. And so we can say, if it is done, something new's begun. And if you, the day that you and I give 
out and push out the things that the enemy's trying to do in here. And in here is the day of new beginnings here and there. And God begins to do new things again and again and again. Oh, those things that were old, they've all passed away. But hey, God has raised us to a new life. Hey, God has raised us to a new hope. And so today, let's call it Good Friday. Because at the end of Good Friday, sin died. Sin died. And you say, then why am I a sinner? Good question. Why are we? Why are we giving in to such bogus junk when God has said he has given us the power and the authority over sin? Why are we giving in to such hopelessness when God has given us resurrection as a anthem? It's almost like I said, okay, you need to know what I can do. Boom, let me put the resurrection of Jesus right there for you to see. And anytime you doubt me, you remember that there's a tomb that's still empty all the way over on the other side of the world. There's a tomb that has no body. There is a grave that does not hold our Lord and our Savior. No, there is a visible, physical evidence that you and I can run to at any time that Jesus Christ got out of that grave. And if he can get out of that grave, you can get out of sin. You and I can get out of anger. We can get away from our lacks of forgiveness. We can get away from our brokenness. We can get away. Today is the day that sin died. And I'm praying today that you can say sin is dead in you. You say, but I get tempted. Temptation's not a sin. It's what you do with temptation. You say, well, the one that tempts me. Oh, no, 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 no. Temptation is, it, the Bible says it's not made from Satan. It's, it, it's when our own desires have, have lost the desires of God and we've lost focus of God and we've started seeking our own way and we're led by our own way instead of God's way. Can I just put this down? From the time that Jesus said it is finished and Jesus rose up from that grave, Satan has never not one day been in control of your life. Not one the only control he has ever had is when you've surrendered or lost control and you've given it over to someone that has no power to have control unless you want him to. And so today in our lives, let's examine ourselves. Sunday morning, I'm going to invite you to grab some grape juice and grab some bread or, or, or whatever you have in your home there. If that's Doritos and Mountain Dew, go ahead and grab it and pull it out. And we're going to start with communion and we're going to reflect, but I'm going to ask you to do a little pre-reflect. Look in you right now. What Jesus killed on the cross, have you revived it? Is there any known sin living in your life, any fear or any doubt or anger or grudge that you've allowed to stay alive in your life? And I want you right now in Jesus' name to bow your heads and to close your eyes and to go to God and say, God, may the same powerful truth that echoed from the cross in his last words as a mortal man, be echoed in the heart of this mortal man and mortal woman now. It is finished. And in Jesus' name, I will not be identified or I will not be controlled or led by who I used to be or what things used to be. But instead, may I be led in spirit and in truth through your holy word and through the power of what was accomplished through the death of Christ on that cross for me. See, the death of Christ is way more than us just realizing that he was beaten and that he was said, no. It was the day that Jesus said, I'm going to take on sin. And only Jesus came out on the other side of that battle. And at some point in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, you and I need to take it on too. Knowing that if we do it in Jesus' name, only Jesus comes out on the other side of that battle. So my prayer for you is that, that your brokenness or hurt, it may still be there. My heart's still heavy. But the heaviness of my heart cannot shade nor hide the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. And while it hurts to see the effects of sin on our world, it brings great joy to see the effects of what Jesus has accomplished in the hearts and lives of those that I love. And so... Russ, if you're watching, I hope we've done justice to what you've asked me to share, knowing that our hearts were in line today, saying this, that there needs to be a time of our life to where the resurrection of Christ isn't something that's on the outside, but it's something that has been made real on the inside. 
so that we're not holding on to things that are going to keep us from talking to our husband and wife tonight or our kids, so that we're not holding on to things that are going to keep us from experiencing the will of God and what he called us to do, so that we're not going to hold on to something that's going to keep us from proclaiming the gospel of God that the world desperately needs to hear. There is a Savior who wants to be your Lord. And when you will accept that Savior and make him your Lord, your life that is out of control will be brought into peace and he will lead, guide, and direct you in truth through his word every single day of your life while protecting and providing every step along the way. And you will never have to worry about how it ends because you already know. See, our sermon that Jesus is preaching through his word is not the same as the sermon that was preached to the disciples. In Mark, he tells them, I'm going to get betrayed by my enemies, they will kill me, and in three days I'll rise again. That has already happened. The sermon that we get is, I was betrayed, I was killed by my enemies, and I have risen. But, I'm coming back. I'm coming to get you. And I will not leave you in this state. And I will not leave you in this world of sorrow and hurt. I will not leave you in a, a spiritual relationship to where all I am is a spiritual connection, which is enough, by the way. No, I so desire to be physically present with you. So I'm coming back. And where I am, you are going to be. And so while we don't have to look for a resurrection of Christ, we can look for the return of Christ because this has been accomplished and finished. And I pray pray that in your heart and in your hope and in your life and in your mind, wherever you are, that today will become a day of renewal. A day will become a day of mourning. Yes, M-O-U-R, mourning, mourning, to where our hearts break because he had to die. But our hope is alive and our celebration is born that because he died, we can live. I live, and Paul said it this way, I was crucified with Christ, but yet I live and I like this. Thank God. If you know my past, I like this. It's not me, but Christ who lives in me. That's where my life comes from now. And I'm telling you, my life with Jesus is way better than anything that I thought was life before I met him. My life now, even with its trials and heartaches and, and, and even with its temptations and even with my mistakes and even with my flaws, even with those things, my life with Christ. Well, I find now that now I know what life is. I never really had life at all. I'm alive today because I've been reborn because of what Jesus Christ put to death on Good Friday. And so may today be the day that certain things in your life end so that God's things for your life can begin. That's my hope and that is my prayer. If you're just joining, go back, check it from the beginning. I don't want you to leave with confusion or anything like that. I thank you for allowing me to just share my heart and to come into your homes in this time. Believe me, I'm trying not to shed these tears, but I, I have no apology for them. Uh, they, they're, they're present in my life because of joy. And yes, there's pain, but yes, you know what? It's the presence that there was love in my heart. And, and it's also the excitement of knowing that just because the life that held that love is gone on this earth, the, the person is still living. They're not dead and nor will they ever die. Um, they've just been promoted. And so in this, I, I want to close this way. Typically, we would put all these links and things where you could spiritually grow, but I don't want to do that. Now, DJ, Pastor David, please don't. I just want to invite you to attend somewhere online for Easter Sunday. I know that all the proper thing for me to do would be to invite you to grace, but I'm not going to do that. I just want to invite you to Jesus. Wherever you can get Jesus, will you please soak him in this weekend because he is all you need. Yes, we have live streams and I've seen hundreds of churches doing live streams and I do not want to compete with anybody. Go to anybody proclaiming Jesus. But ultimately, my request for you is this. Just get to Jesus this weekend and start now. Go read what he did for you. Go know that Friday wasn't the end game, thank God. That Sunday was coming and know this in your life. If this is the Friday of your life where things have fallen apart, Sunday's coming.
Keep your head up. Keep your eyes up. I lift my eyes to the heels for which my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, the makers of heaven and of earth, the maker of everything. God bless you. We love you dearly. Um, the only thing we'll post in this link, guys, if you don't mind, is 10 o'clock Sunday morning. We're going to do communion and celebrate our risen Savior it's supposed to storm, so I don't know. I might be standing in the rain, who knows? But I'm still going to be standing in the sun, the S-O-N, because Jesus Christ has made me something I should never be and given me a life I should never have and given me a hope that I can stand on. And that same Lord and that same Savior wants your life too. And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, then before we close tonight, would you just join me in a moment of question? Do you believe that he's the son of God, that he was who he says he is? And if you believe that Jesus was a literal man that was the son of God that came to pay the debt for your sins, do you also believe that he wasn't dead forever when he died, but that three days later he rose from the grave? The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, I'd invite you to check that out, that if we confess with our mouths that he's the Lord Jesus, confession meaning openly declare, not a silent prayer moment, but at some point an open declaration that he is the Lord. And we believe in our hearts that God is raised from the dead. Can I tell you this? Belief is the confession of the heart. Declaration is the confession of faith. It's saying, I'm now taking what I believe in my heart and I'm making it known in my faith. And if you believe in your heart, he raised from the dead. Then at some point of your life, there has to be a confession of your mouth that Jesus is the Lord of your life. And if you've never accepted him as the Lord of your life, then I want to invite you right now, whether you're watching this live or you're going to watch it later, uh, whether a friend shared it with you, it doesn't matter. I want you to grab this, that the greatest thing you can do to honor Christ's death and resurrection is to accept the reason. And that reason that he died, that reason that he rose again is you. You are the reason. And you and I must accept the fact that he did it for me. And because he loves us so much, we must surrender our lives to him. And maybe in the quietness of your home or your car, you can confess to heaven through simply saying, Jesus, God, I believe in your son. I believe. I, you put it in your words. It's, my words will never save you. But your truth made known to God, that's what saves you. I know I was a sinner and I was in need of him. Tell him. Tell God exactly what you need. And if right now you need salvation, tell God and just simply say, save me. I need you to save me. And then at some point of your life, will you make it known? Maybe right here in the comment section, maybe shoot a video, put the word out there, make it your status. That today is the day right here on Good Friday. You have declared Jesus the Lord of your life and you are now proud to be part of the family of God, the eternal family that has no end. And would you just proclaim today to heaven first and to others next that you have made Jesus the Lord of your life. And if you are doing that right now, welcome to the family of God. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, shall be saved. No ifs, ands, buts, and about it. You say, but I, you know, God ain't interested in what you've done. He knew what you did. That's why he sent his son. He knows the sins that you've committed. That's why Jesus died. You, you don't have to say, but there's so many things I got to get right. No, God knew you couldn't get it right on your own. That's why he sent his son. If you could get it right on your own, I guarantee you Jesus wouldn't have died. Why would any father sacrifice their son if you could achieve it or I could achieve it? It's because you couldn't get it right. It's because you were so messed up. It's because I couldn't get it right and I was messed up that Jesus had to die. So stop listening to that stupid lie that's coming into your mind right now trying to convince you that you cannot earn salvation, that you're not good enough to be saved. The truth is this. God wants to come into your life already telling you that that's the truth. You're not good enough to earn salvation. That's why it's a gift. You're not, you're not rich enough to buy it. That's why he wrapped it for you and put it in your life and said, here, just take this. And so today, if you've never accepted Christ, it's not about what you're able to do. It's 
actually about what you're not able to do. You're not able to pay this debt. You're not able to make this right. So accept the one who was able. And that's the truth. It's just saying, okay, God, I know I can't, but I believe you did. And they, today, listen, isn't it cool? That on the day that represents the day that Jesus said it is finished and sin will no longer keep you identified as a sinner, as a broken, as a lost person, that you can say, today's the day I gave my heart to Jesus Christ and it's done. Old things just passed away and new life has just begun. That's my hope and that's my prayer for you. That is what I, I hope that you will do, if not today, if later. But you know what? I want to go beyond that. If you've accepted Christ, I want to walk with you in this journey. Feel free. Please call us. Hit me up on my direct message on my own personal page. Shoot a message to the church Facebook. We want to help you grow in this walk with Jesus Christ. If you're a believer that has stayed in infancy of your faith and never developed into what the, the mature believer that God wants you to do or to be, we want to walk with you and mentor you and disciple you to be able to live in the best life that God has called you to live. Not through our opinions. Our opinions are junk. But through the word of God and what God has declared is good enough for you and good enough for me. And so I love you dearly. I'm giving you no announcements. I'm not asking for any of your giving. I don't want any of those things. None of it. I want you to go celebrate with your family's arisen savior. And on Sunday, find somewhere, some church. If there's somebody else that's doing it better, go there on their Facebook, on their live stream, and let's celebrate the fact that he's not just savior. He's Lord because only Jesus has ever had the power to walk out of his own grave. Only Jesus can do that. You said Lazarus did it. Nope. Lazarus walked out of his grave because Jesus told him to. And here's the beauty. You and I can walk out of anything if Jesus is the one that we're allowing to tell us to. If Jesus is the one given the authority and now he's Lord, he's king. He's more than a savior to me. He's my everything, and I pray to God, he's yours too. I love you. I miss you. I cannot wait to celebrate with you again. Uh, if I get to see you on live on Easter, I, awesome. If I don't, I'm, I'm praying it's because you, you chose to go somewhere else, and that's okay. If God ministered to you through this, share it. I don't care. This ain't my message. It's his. But let's get the word out there. Let's let the world hear. We serve a risen king today, and I am proud to be a child of God. I am proud to be his, and I am so thankful that he is mine. I pray you are too. I love you. Stay safe, stay smart, stay obedient. I'll see you next time.